morning, everyone. Uh, this is the fourth Sunday in Lent, so it's Lent 4C. Now, like quite Lent 4B, which is my third most favorite Sunday of the church year, this ranks up there, and you'll see why, because we have a very familiar story in our gospel reading. I think so familiar that we sometimes we miss some of the, the important details in the story, uh, and it's the story of the prodigal son, well, the story of the two sons. So if you want to turn to that, uh, first, in the middle of the handout, from Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, um, and dealing with that. So Jesus, uh, historically, Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem. Uh, I don't know how, you know, if it's three months out, four months out from time-wise uh, from Jesus' uh, crucifixion and, and resurrection. Uh, but Jesus along the way, and he's telling stories, I like to say he's starting to Turn up the heat on the thought, belief of uh, the people of the day. And because this story uh, is, um, uh, it, ears would have been, what, what did he just say? I mean, red flags would have been going up all over everywhere uh, with Jesus. Now, beginning. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sin uh, sinners and eats with them. They, they, they're, what they're really complaining about is why isn't Jesus hanging out with us? We're the cool people. We're the ones that are in the kingdom. We are the ones that get it right. You know, these sinners and tax collectors, really, Jesus? Why are you hanging out with those people? And so Jesus tells them this parable. Now, the two parables before this is the parable of the lost sheep. Uh, where the guy goes, he leaves the 99, he goes out and looks for the one, brings it home. And then the parable of the lost coin, uh, the lady has nine or ten coins, she loses one and she just tears the house apart. And it's just great joy in finding what was lost and now is found. And now Jesus um, tells the story of uh, the parable of the lost sons. We call it prodigal son, but I th it's the second part of the story that's just important. So... Um, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger son of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Now, um, you, normally when you get an inheritance, what's got to happen first? Someone's got to die. So what the younger son is telling his dad is, I wish you were dead so I can get my stuff. Now, Old Testament, this would have been the the people would have said this, the old, in Old Testament times, the oldest son got a double portion. They divided it all up. The oldest son got a double portion, and everything else then was divided amongst the other family members. So in order for the father to give probably his son uh, his inheritance, he has to liquidate stuff. I mean, he's got to sell some things off. So in other words, the older son is going, what? wait a minute, that, that's part of my inheritance. That's, that's, and you're just giving it to him? Everybody else in the community would have said, you know what you need to do to your son? Put him in his place. In other words, anything short of death would be okay. I mean, how dare this younger son wish that you were dead? But what does he do? He divides the property, gives it to them. Um, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he quan uh, squandered his property in reckless living. And then he spent everything. A severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs, and was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. So the very fact that, I mean, he squanders it all away. Of course, we all know. If someone comes in and says, hey, this round is on me. I'm buying this dinner. Who are you going to hang out with? Your new best friend until he runs out. Now you go look for a new, newer best friend. And so he's going, I have to go find a job. And what does he find to do? He's going to take care of pigs. Now, first century Jewish ears would have went, <gasps> because what was wrong with pigs? They were unclean. 
you were not allowed to even be around unclean animals, and the pig was the epitome of the unclean animal. So the very fact that he's working with them, and then what else? He's longing to eat what the pigs ate. Oh, how terrible is this? This guy is bad. Really, really bad. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, when he went, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't need to do this, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, the son leaves with his inheritance squanders it all the way, but what's the impression, what is the father doing this whole time while his son is away? Praying for, but what is, what is he really doing? Is he coming? Is he coming yet? Do you see him? Is he coming? Now, what you don't know, it'll come up later in the, in the story, and I think this happens, the day that his son leaves, he takes a calf starts to fatten it up with the hope that his son would come back and they would slaughter the fattened calf and have a celebration that he's coming back. In other words, dad was holding out that his son would come back one day. Don't fall. <laughs> yeah. With that. So he's looking off. And what does the dad do? What I mean, what does he say? Verse 20. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him. What's compassion mean? The, the Greek word is a great word because it's a very, it's a, a well, it's, it, this is the Greek word, explotsomai, meaning be moved in your gut. I mean, it is, a, he's going, there's my son. He's coming back. He has compassion on him. He's not going to hold this against him. And then what does he do? Run. He runs and embraces him. Now, first century Judaism, first century, you don't run. When you are the dad and you have great wealth, you walk. <laughs> With dignity. Because you're wearing a robe. <laughs> <laughs> The very fact that the dad sees his son, his son is coming, his son should have went, wait a minute, dad's running to me, and he embraces me. He's giving me a hug. And all the time, what's the son doing? Here, let's go back, verse 21. And the son said to, the, to, to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer the worthy to be called your son. So he's practicing this along the way. I know, I'll come back. Now, there's two ways you can interpret this. The son is still trying to manipulate the process here. He's saying, I'll go back to dad. I won't be his son, but I'll be his servant. And hopefully, I can work off the debt. I'm still going to call the shots. I mean, this is one way you can do that. Or the son is being very repentant, saying, I really messed up dad. I don't deserve to be called your son. I'll be happy if I just get to be one of your servants, one of your slaves. So he's doing this, and he's beginning to say it, and the father is doing what? Here. Uh, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead, he's now alive, he is lost, and is found, 
and they began to celebrate. The son is saying, hey, I'm kind of sorry, doing all that. What's the dad doing? He's not even paying attention. He's going to the servants. Go get the coat. Go get the fattened calf. We're going to have a party. Because my son who was gone, dead, is now back. He's alive. Could you never, I mean, they didn't know if he was coming back or not. I mean, what are they, they don't know that. For all you know, they're going to be dead. He's going to be dead. And yet the father says, he's not even paying attention to what his son is saying. He says, you're not, you're not a servant. You're my son. I'm going to show you what that means. I'm going to give you the coat of many colors. <laughs> I mean, there's, you, you can read that into that. This is the favorite son. Every child of God is a favorite one of God. Like you say, there's a big refrigerator in the sky, and we all have our picture signs. <laughs> really big refrigerator. Um, with that. So the, fa- the father says, okay, he's back. We're going to celebrate. Yay! Fantastic. Now, there were two sons. There's one that remained. The older son, the loyal son, the obedient son, maybe. Verse 25. And his older son, who was in the field, as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Odd. We don't usually have music and dancing going on in house. What's going on? He called one of the servants and asked, what all this meant? What's with the dancing? What's with the music? Ah. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Now the younger son's going, or the older son's going, what, what, what just happened? My brother came back and dad's throwing a party. My younger brother wanted my dad dead. Why, why is dad doing this? So, verse 28, the older son says, I'm not going in, I'm angry. And so the Pharisees and the scribes have been listening, they would go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, why, why, would, why would you want to go to a party with someone who treated us this way? Why would we want to do that? And yet, what does the dad do? He came out. And entreated him, begged him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. So, Dad, I did everything you asked of me, everything, and probably even more. And I never asked you for any of this, and yet you didn't give me a young goat, yet you're giving brother here which I've noticed since the day he's left, that you've been fattening that calf for some unknown reason. I thought it was for me. But lo and behold, it's not for me. It's for the brother who squandered all the inheritance away. So you're giving him even more. Uh. Father says, uh, you know, uh, disobeyed your command, never gave me your own But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, well, we know it was squandered in whatever kind of living. I mean, this is where the the older son throws this in here. You killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The question is this, how does the story end? Did the older brother go into the celebration? Did his older brother forgive him for what he did? Did the younger son, after the next day, and maybe sometime later go, well, this is not exactly what I thought it would be. Uh, I wonder if I could ask for my father for another inheritance and go again. Could I do that again? I mean, we don't know the end of the story. 
But really, the end of the story is this. Jesus tells the story, and really, what's the question that Jesus is asking all of us? Who are you? Now, who is the father in the story? Parables always, earthly story, heavenly meaning. Who is the father in the story? It's God. It's God the Father. Who are the sons? We are. We are the, either the one that wishes, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God, and we go away, and we come back, God wel welcomes us with open arms. Or are we like the older son who were with dad, but are we really with dad? I've done everything you've asked of me. Uh, but you've given me nothing. And God says, oh, you, everything is yours. Just got to ask. It's all there. You can have whatever you want. So that's the question for us. Which, who are we? Are we like the older son or like the younger son? And the answer is yes. Because sometimes we're like the younger son and we squander the way the gifts that God has given to us. And God brings us back. Sometimes we're like the older son and we just go through the motions. Oh, point of the story here is it's not the sons who are the main point the main person in the story it's who it's dad it's the father it's god himself who offers us these wonderful gifts forgiveness life and salvation and continues to give that to us yes do we squander it away sometimes most definitely do we take for granted what the father's done for us all the time all the time and dealing with that so this is the story that we have here. Now, any questions on that before we move on? I don't grab anything with this. All right, let's go to the Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 12. Um, Isaiah chapter 11, we hear around Christmas, um, it's the uh, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. On him will, uh, on his shoulders will come and out of the root or out of the stump of Jesse will come the shoot. And so this, this, you can read this, the first coming of Jesus as the babe born in Bethlehem, but also the second coming of Jesus as he comes again on the last day. So that's the, you will say in that day. That's what the reference is for. It's either the first coming or the second coming. Or both and. You know, whatever that is. And it can be both as we read this. So what will you say in that day? That God will come, he will save his people. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry at me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that, that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So in response to what God has done for us, we are to be thankful. We are to say, God is our salvation. Now, I asked, what was the end of the story? Now, if we were to write the end of the story of the prodigal son, what would the prodigal son, what would his life be? What would, what would be his reaction or his attitude after his father brought him back? One of thanksgiving for what his dad did. Being grateful for who his dad is, does. Here, Isaiah talks about that. On that day when the Lord will come, bring us home to heaven, or he comes in the first time, as that babe born in Bethlehem, bring us salvation, forgiveness in life. What's our response? We give thanks. We call upon the name of the Lord. We realize what God has done for us. We have a, a, a different view of life. We have a different attitude. Uh, our uh, our um, you know, response to what God has done is one of thanksgiving and praise. That was the Lord speaking to me, that I finally got it right. Bing. I thought the bell would be a little deeper, but that's all right. That's okay. All right, questions on that? 
I mean, beautiful words, Isaiah 11, chapters 11 and 12, um, in talking about the salvation that God has given to us. All right, uh, epistle reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, um, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us uh, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. So in here, Paul's talking about this great exchange that happens with Christ and with us. Um, he, we, he takes our sins and he gives us his righteousness. Uh, he takes uh, our, uh, the wrath that we deserve and he took it upon himself and he gives us peace with God. And so we, we have this, this great exchange uh, happening. Uh, and therefore, as Paul says, we are a new creation. We have a different way that we think, how we act, how we respond um, in what God has called us to be. And this all comes from God. It's all God's doing. God made it all happen. We might come to God like the younger son and say, well, I know I messed up, but here, I'll do this, that, and the other thing, and then you make that happen. And God says, shut up. That's not how it goes. I give it to you. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. It's all free gift. It's all there for you. All you can do is reject it. But I'm giving you the offer. Here it is. And so this great exchange that takes place between us and God, between us and Jesus, that we are reconciled. And Paul says, not only have you been reconciled, but now you are ambassadors. What's an ambassador? What do ambassadors do? They talk. But who do they talk for? People. But specifically who? All right. Let's just say, I'm the ambassador to England. I go in and talk to the prime minister. Am I just talking for myself? Who am I talking for? I'm, call, I'm talking for the President of the United States. Um, the words that I speak are like President Biden is talking. I mean, that's what, that's what an ambassador does. You are ambassadors for Christ, so that when you speak, you are speaking for who? For Christ. You're actually saying the words that Jesus says, whatever those words are. You know, that's what, that, that's what an ambassador is. We are speaking. Jesus is literally using our voices, our actions, to speak to other people, whatever that is. You're an ambassador. Not only are you a witness, but you're an ambassador. Ambassador known as sins. Think about that. Ambassador, Pat, Lynn, Arlene, I mean, all our names. We are ambassadors for Jesus. We've been given that special, special authority, if you want to put it that way, or that special, special job that God wants us to be doing, speaking for him to others. Questions, comments? All right, let's jump over to the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 51. What do you know about Psalm 51? Anything... The Psalm of David, uh, on the third Sunday of the month, we sing, well, we are now going to sing Psalm 51 after every sermon on the third Sunday of the month. We have put that back in. The create and clean heart in me, O oh God, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, you know, take not your Holy Spirit from me, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Um, it's the words of David after he had been confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. This is the psalm he wrote in response to that. 
It's a wonderful song. And uh, he talks about how God has forgiven him. David becomes the prodigal son. He becomes the prodigal son. He's the one that God gives him everything, and yet what does he want? He wants even more, and by getting more, he's going to commit adultery, murder, and he's going to cover it all up. Or he thinks he's covering it up. But what's very interesting, this happens in chapter 11. At the end of chapter 11, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, at the end of the chapter, it says this, and God knew what David did, and God was not pleased with what he did. Well, David's thinking, nobody knows about this. You know, Bathsheba's married to Uriah the Hittite. David gets Bathsheba pregnant. David has Uriah the Hittite killed, but in the glories of battle, Uriah the Hittite's going to be seen as a hero, that he died fighting the Philistines. Oh, but, and David, in the goodness of his heart, brings Bathsheba into his house because this great hero died, and everybody's, but God's, no, that's, no, no. And so David is confronted by Nathan the prophet, and David confesses his sins, and he writes this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inner being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. So this is like... David coming back to God the Father as the prodigal son, and he's saying, "Uh, I don't deserve any of this. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. And what does God do with David's sin? He forgives him. Nathan says, your sin has been taken away. God no longer holds that sin against you. It's true for all of us. We sin, we confess our sin, and what does God do with our sin? He doesn't remember it anymore. He doesn't bring it up. We might bring it up and he'll go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't remember that. Did you do that? I don't remember that because I forgave that. Huh. Don't bring it up again. You know, we, we have this. So this wonderful God having mercy on us according to his love, blotting out transgressions, sins, iniquities, all those. Um, and, and we can take great comfort in that. And God the Father does that. And he says, kill the fattened cat, put on the colored robe, put the ring on him. He's my son. He's my daughter. Or she's my daughter. That will never end. That never changes. We have that. So. And then the colic of the day. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you will receive us as your child and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. That kind of summarizes the theme of the day. Uh, His mercy is new. Yes, we deserve but punishment, but you give us way more than we desire or deserve. And he does that because that's who he is. Who God is. We're going to hear that today in church, where Joseph um, received much, way more than he desired or even that he deserved. And you see that throughout the scriptures. David, Joseph, Moses, I mean all of us as well. So we look forward to that. Questions, comments? There's no way that I covered this that you have don't have any questions. Well, thank you, and and it's uh and go go much deeper, but that.
But that parable of the prodigal son is just, I mean, not only is it in, in the church, Christianity, but this, this story, girl, other people have used this story to talk about uh, forgiveness and, and uh, uh, giving to people what they don't deserve. And then the second part is, you know, are we like the second son? Well, I've done everything, God. Why are you letting those people in? Ugh. They don't deserve to be here. Well, neither do you, but that's beside the point. But we got to open our eyes and see that. So, with that, all right? Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. I know. I, it was, they, I'm sure they're going, <sighs> or some of them are going, he's got it right. Because it's not all the Pharisees that were against Jesus. We, we find out later there are many who were secret followers of Jesus. But they couldn't let that be known because, you know, you're a Pharisee and you didn't want to be kicked out. I mean, that was kind of the thing. So I, you know, that they, as Jesus talks about God's grace and how it does, God's grace does not come to us on our terms, but it's always on God's terms. And it's way more than we deserve or even that we desire as well. So, but yeah, I think we were not happy. So let's close the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.